So here I'm going to talk about the pollination process. It was actually very important to our basic survival in production of food in general. And here we see an example of a bee going through and doing this exact process I'm going to be describing. So to start with, why are there different kinds of flowers? So this is, again, pertaining to angiosperms and the pollination process. So insects and plants have co-evolved so that certain insects specialize in visiting particular kinds of flowers. A particular insect carries pollen from one individual flower to another of the same species. Bees are the most numerous insect pollinator. Birds can also pollinate some flowers, especially red ones. So if you have a hummingbird um, feeder, typically you put red dye in it. Uh, grasses and some other angiosperms have reverted to wind pollination. So just because um, there are insect pollinators, they don't pollinate necessarily everything. So bees and UV light, which is interesting. Uh, bees see UV light, so flowers look different to them compared to us. So remember our visible light spectrum here. UV is ultraviolet waves. So ultraviolet, we're talking more over here in our light spectrum here. Getting closer to our x-rays and gamma rays than we are from our infrared or our radar um, waves there. So it's called ultraviolet because it's beyond the violet spectrum. So what we see versus what bees are able to see. Differences in color sensitivity between humans, honeybees, and hummingbirds is what provides flowers to actually look different. And I think these are some notable examples. So under normal light, we see this as a consistently yellow flower. However, under UV light, this is almost like a target region that develops in the center. And that's where the bees are going to see, and that's where they're going to target to try to find the, the pollen or the nectar in their case. Same thing here. Normal, we see our nice kind of yellow. Here, under UV light, we see that distinctive darkening center region. And same goes for this flower and also this flower. Provides kind of that extra highlight to tell the bees, hey, come here, this is where um, the nectar is. As I mentioned, there's um, flowers match the pollinator. So hummingbirds tend to pollinate red flowers, and you'll notice they have a very long beak, thin beak at that, and the flowers replicate that. Bats pollinate white flowers that have sweet smells and open at night. Uh, those sweet smells are so the bats can help detect them. Moths are also nighttime pollinators, and some gourds will pollinate very white flowers um, that open at night again. Ants can also pollinate here, as we see here, and ant getting all these pollen grains over him go through and go through to the next flower to help transfer some of that, or even help that same flower get cross get pollinated but with itself. Uh, the pollination process in seed plants: free water is not required in the fertilization process. Pollination by insects, wind, or other agents transfers pollen to an ovule. The pollen grain then cracks open and sprouts as a pollen tube um, in bringing the sperm cells directly to the egg. That's what we see here. So here's our flower. If you're not familiar with the parts, again, refer back to some of the other videos that I have, particularly gymnosperms and angiosperms. See, the pollen lands here on the sticky stigma, and it travels down here and has to go all the way to reach the ovule. So there's a distance that it needs to travel. So just because the pollen is transferred to these stigma doesn't mean it automatically gets um, pollinated. That needs to be able to survive and live and be able to travel all this distance. Now in particular, we have something called double fertilization. So two sperm or pollen grains are required to produce a seed. One sperm fertilizes the egg to produce the zygote, 2N. The other fertilizes polar nuclei to form a, the 3N endosperm, which is the food source for the embryo. So this means one pollen grain is fertilizing the egg to produce the zygote. The other one is fertilizing this area here to produce the food for that um, seed once germinated to initially feed on. So we see here's our pollen grain, our pollen tube, two sperm cells coming down, both fertilizing this particular egg. One technically is fertilizing it, the other one is making the endosperm, which is the food region here. So pollen grain adheres to the stigma, which contains two cells, generates this um, cell and tube cell. <clears throat> the pollen tube grows into the style. The generative cell transfers inside the pollen tube, dividing to form two sperm cells. The pollen tube penetrates the opening in the ovule to call the macrophile. Here, one of the sperm fertilizes the egg to form the diploid zygote. The other sperm fertilizes two polar nuclei to form the triploid endosperm, which becomes the food source for the growing embryo. This is an important process that does occur. Here's the same image down here. 
This double fertilization endosperms produce special, highly nutritious tissue called the endosperm for their seeds. When a flower is pollinated, the pollen tube grows down to form pollen grain on the stigma. The pollen grain contains two haploid sperm. The first sperm fuses with the egg at the base of the ovary. The second sperm fuses with the polar nuclei to form the triploid endosperm cell, which divides faster than the zygote and gives rise to the endosperm tissue. Remember, this endosperm tissue is the food region for the cell, for the um, seed. The process of fertilization to produce both zygote and endosperm is called double fertilization. Now, that um, pollination process is actually accidental. So it's kind of amazing that something we're so dependent on as far as sustaining our species and providing enough food for the world is actually an accidental process. The pollinator gets nectar and accidentally transfers pollen, as we see here. The male flower, so here's a bee going down, getting nectar, bumping into this portion, transferring pollen over. Again, the bee's more concerned about the nectar than the actual pollen. The bee flies out of this flower, and this is a female flower. Uh, this is a squash plant that produces both, and that's why I chose this to show it distinctively. Here's the bee going back down here to get the nectar, and now it's kind of taking the pollen that it acquired here, and transferring it to the stigma here. That's why you typically see bees in these types of flowers with their heads down, trying to absorb the nectar down here. They're not really concerned with the transfer of pollen. They're more concerned with the acquisition of the nectar. And the pollen that's getting transferred is simply an accidental process. We have two parts of pollination. We have something called cross-pollination. Pollen is transferred between two different individuals from the same species. Here's one flower, is another flower. This is cross-pollination. Advantages is increases our genetic variability in this species, but it can produce unfit individuals. Versus self-pollination, where we see pollen from the same flower getting pollinated with the same flower. Um, this pollen from the same individual is used to pollinate the same plant. The advantage is this produces seeds when individuals are isolated. It kind of reduces the genetic variability um, and doesn't open the species up to really adapting much to the environment. So again, pros and cons to each, but both can occur and produce viable seeds. Lastly, the life cycle of an angiosperm, tying a lot of the other videos together, tying in some of the flower anatomy, um, some of the terms we discussed previously, such as meiosis and mitosis, um, the sperm cells, the egg cells, pollination process, um, something you may want to review and be familiar with uh, for the quiz coming up on this section.